Alice in Wonderland has been cemented as a timeless classic both in literature and cinema. But you know what it doesn't have? Uh, goth! Goth. 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 I mean, think about it. Having a goth Alice in Wonderland will look sick as shit, right? Fucking Christ. The Absolute Mad Men Returns is a psychological horror action platformer developed by Spicy Horse and creatively spearheaded by American McGee. Yes, that's a real name. McGee's a quaint little lad with a fetish for fairy tales. He worked on level design on Doom 2 and Quake, but after getting laid off from it, he went and made his own studio publishing American McGee's Alice in Space Year 2000. Now, I've never really seen anybody talk about the game's prequel as much as I do, but I re actually do remember my dad owning the game, and I used to watch him play it when I was a wee bevis. The game has a really nice, grim-dark aesthetic, complemented in part by the moody lighting and the greediness of the old-school graphics. Can't comment on anything else for the time being since I haven't really played the game. As for my memories with Madness Returns, I can't recall anything aside from Alice perhaps invoking some half-chubs. So why the fuck did I write that in? I would fuck her. And seeing all the enemy concept art and renders in Game Informer really got me intrigued to play it, even though I never got around to playing it because I fucking never saw a PS2 copy literally anywhere. <laughs> You're greeted with a pleasant introduction to the game. Alice seems to be having a therapy session recalling the events of the house fire when she was younger. All the while having these twisted and distorted visualizations of Wonderland presenting a cool puppet pop-up book looking ass cutscenes. Anyways, the therapist tells you to fuck off and get more pills before the next appointment, so you go and do that. It's my turn to forget Alice. Now, Charlie. Your pa was hung for killing your ma who beat you. Not long after being the typical woman you are, you get lost in an alleyway and get cornered by multiple bug men. So, you know, happens. But fear not, Granny is here to save you. But now she's a bug too. What? Not much explanation is given for all of this other than, whoa, it's a weird, creepy vision, ooh. But it doesn't really matter since the ground literally starts to crack afterwards and you fall down a pit to Wonderland. And right then and there is when you can finally start playing the game. The game is an action platformer with segments of combat sprinkled in between all the running and jumping. Combat, thankfully, isn't on the tight two side of aimless button mashing, but it instead takes a liking to the Ocarina of Time Z-targeting and slashing and dodging. Most of the enemies don't require you to do much other than attacking, but there will be the occasional weak spot and made you have to mess around with before you're jumping and deal some heavy damage. The difficulty in the combat is not really caused by the enemies themselves, but it instead comes from the crowd control in the fights. Most of the areas you're fighting are these small spaces where you can barely move to dodge. And just resorting to Z-targeting will limit your field of view, effectively handicapping you. Fights can become hectic and fast-paced in some of the later levels, when you're facing 8 enemies in a single circle platform, all trying to chew your bony ass at once. Weapons used to defend yourself consist of a comically oversized kitchen knife as your default weapon, a fucking stick horse with the strength of a chancleta, and an umbrella to deflect projectiles. As for the guns you get, you'll have a Pepper Grandu Gatling gun that you'll probably use more as a way to shoot switches than to fight since it has such a shit DPS, and a teapot cannon you get halfway shooting boiling balls of tea at other enemies. There is also a clockwork bomb that, while its main use is to be a paperweight for solving puzzles, can also help stun enemies during fights. There were also a lot of weapons that were unfortunately cut from the game, which sucks since the combat would have benefited Gretly from these things. Gret 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 Having even more ways to fuck with enemies instead of patiently waiting till finding an opening and spamming would have broken the monotony. She had like a fire whip and a hammer with a mechanic involving tarot cards, a teacup change to swing around, and a fucking magical little wand. You can upgrade all these weapons in your inventory once you've collected and required a number of teeth. Yeah. Just teeth. You can find them anywhere, beating up enemies or breaking shit into the environment like Ratchet and Clank or the Devil May Cry games. When you get cornered and bent, you resort to a berserker mode that activates when you have low health, giving you higher damage output, but you don't really regain any health in the end. So if you don't hurry up and clear up the place by the time the effect wears off, you're shit out of luck, buddy. However, you can expand your health a bit more by completing healing challenges scattered across the game that usually involves you fighting a couple of enemies and taking some basic puzzles to get a roast paint. This game's version of the heart pieces. This is kind of a useless part of the game though, since death in the game is completely meaningless. It'll take you several falls to your death to completely drain your health bar, and if you ever end up dying in combat, you'll respawn right before the battle again, this time with a full bar. Kinda counterintuitive. Platforming though, the whole second half of the game feels kinda jank. The game actually gets away with it having platforming compromise of floating chunks of concrete and large stretches of walkways, all thanks to the dreamlike setting. There really isn't an ingenuity to the level design, it's just really plain. You get to go to many fractured locations of Wonderland, 
My favorite being East Lion, offering platforming on floating mahjong pieces, fights with goddamn samurai bugs, and 2D platforming segments inside paintings. You start to notice around this point that all these levels feel kinda empty. Not in terms of the environment themselves, but that everything you do is repetitive shit that you've done before. If it were the case with the combat, then I'd be completely fine, but having to go through the fourth slide in the last 30 minutes and trying to locate the invisible platform or placing the clockwork bomb on a pressure plate to open the door for the 80th time consecutively bored me. The devs really should have implemented more puzzles instead of boring platforming gimmicks. They should have just gone the whole way and just emulate Zelda level design. Any slight bad tricking could have helped you familiarize yourself with the level and take the world in a little bit more instead of running, jumping, and fighting forwards until you collect the exposition MacGuffin. It's even more of a joke that the puzzles presented in the game can just be skipped without any penalization. Through the game, you'll find these little memory fragments hidden in the nookies and the crannies of each level, revealing more of not only about Alice as a character, but how people around her treat her. You'll listen to audio tapes of your psychiatrist, your hooker nanny, and even Alice's now crispy family. They tend to serve as a sort of window into each character's mind rather than providing any actual detailed backstory, providing little quirky anecdotes, or at least that's most of what I heard since I didn't bother to collect them all. The presentation is where most of the game's effort was placed. Alice is the only decently looking attractive person in the world, and by decent attractive I mean Jesus fucking Christ I want Alice to disembowel him. Every character in the game looks like they were all born with a horrible deformity. The team was aiming for that gritty, tattered up, and creepily stylish character design you've seen in games before like Dishonored and maybe Psychonauts if you squint your eyes a little bit, but uh, there's only one problem. They didn't even try to be charming with these models at all. Gee, I don't know, maybe that's the point. Where the shit smearing actually works though is in the environments, at least in the real work segments. Walking around dingy, depressive, and eternally smoggy Victorian London is a treat. The stench of piss permeates the rat infested town, everyone's downright miserable. There's public beatings and hookers selling themselves in broad daylight and there's always people arguing and insulting each other when you eavesdrop into any of the buildings. Many of the people in town are also painted as horrible abusers and manipulators as well. It's a shame that these areas are not only extremely linear, but they're few and far between. But that's not all Alice 2 Ripto's rage has to offer in terms of the grim dark. <coughs> if it wasn't already blatantly obvious, the entire game revolves around mental health and the issues regarding it. Alice is an immensely troubled soul suffering from schizophrenia and dementia. The whole time, you're basically navigating through these warped manifestations of your trauma, piecing together what really happened the night the house caught on fire, and conquering the demons that have been haunting Alice her whole life. You just know, deep down, you weren't the one at fault despite everyone else stating the contrary. People have argued over the issue of glamorizing mental illness. I personally feel indifferent about it. It's a fucking video game. A lot of the characters you meet throughout have these odd cartoonish ragtime Brit mannerisms both in Wonderland and in the real world. My favorite one being the carpenter, despite his role as a mega cunt, I still love his design and character a lot. Alice, escaped to Africa's goth art style, can make the most suicidal suicide girl unsuicidal, or the opposite of that. This is a fucking bad joke. Alice even gets to wear different outfits for each level you visit, and industrial goth is the best one and there's no fucking arguments about it. I really love the different scenery in the game offered throughout. Sure, having the game take place in a dream world does seem like the biggest cop-out for level designers to put as many floating platforms as they wish, until it starts resembling Bubsy 3D. But these environments all feel so magical when you first step into them. I mean, just take a look at that breathtaking view. The cats woke me up, not the, not, not the joke that I was making for the video about the music being boring. <laughs> I don't fucking die. This is probably the most conflicted I've ever felt when looking back and appreciating a game. To put it simply, Alice in Madness Returns is a fart. A massive, odor-rich, and long-reaching fart released with such a bombastic force out of the golden holy asshole of God, but still a fart. The whole experience when looking back at it is objectively bland, unoriginal, and stretched out way too fucking thin. Yet there is so much detail and care that was put into not only the art design and the atmosphere, but the characters, the story, and the themes as well. 
After reaching the halfway point, every level started feeling exactly the same. The rice field world didn't disguise this fact at all. The combat itself isn't half bad, but the fact that once you realize that you're only gonna be fighting the same four, maybe five enemy types throughout the whole world, no no, that's bad, it suddenly becomes a tedious little roadblock on your path to finish the game. And that's how my experience boiled down to in the second half. I started caring less about the plot or the characters or the big dreamlike worlds I was dropped into, and more about seeing the end credits scroll so I can just play something else. I was really fighting the urge to just look up the final boss and end the end of the damn thing. The fucking thing took me about 3 weeks to beat despite finishing it under 9 hours, just because of how draining of an experience it was for me. But nevertheless, I was hooked into Alice's story, and it wouldn't be the only thing she has that I would want to be hooked onto though, ha 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 I just really wanted to see if she ended up managing to go through the ordeal and get revenge on the people who wronged her, and it kinda wasn't worth it. If I had to sum it up a second time because I have no clue on how to properly write a review, I'd say this game feels more like a next gen version of a PS2 platformer game. You all fucking know the ones. It still features a a quality presentation of a decently budgeted PS3 and 360 game, but it's still so fucking meh. Too meh. I'm, uh, having some trouble trying to find a conclusion for this, so, uh, I'm just gonna give this game a 10 up front, because, uh, gods? I think everybody can agree on that. Now it's time for the best part of the video, of course. The end cards. <laughs> I, I always find myself in a situation where I have to apologize every time I upload a new video and, you know, talk to my subscribers for a bit. This time I couldn't really use the excuse of, oh, I'm busy with schoolwork and shit. I've just been enjoying summer a lot lately and I've kind of lost motivation for YouTube a little bit, but uh, I finally got my lazy ass to finish this shit, so I guess I'm happy. Hopefully, that's the keyword there, the next upload won't take as long and I already recorded it, so it's just a matter of editing that as quickly as possible. Also been writing a couple of shorter editorials, so I can just sprinkle them in between uploads. Again, just gotta <laughs> trust me and have faith in me that I don't turn into a lazy cunt and ignore all the YouTube shit again. Just send me recommendations, whatever, just insult me. Just regular shit. See you guys later. B -b also, as a little side note, you, you fucking cunts. Shipping Bumby and Alice together. What the fuck, man?